Does everybody think that the Commonwealth of Australia is a function of government? There are two Commonwealths of government. There are two emblems. Greg and I were talking about this. Who, what, who, what's on the emblem of, uh, of the Commonwealth of Australia? Yeah, no. That's on the emblem of the corporate government of Australia. If you look up Commonwealth of Australia, it's registered on the SEC as a business. It trades, as is the ATO, as is every state government and local government. They are businesses. What's the lifeblood of a, of a company? Profit. So then the government, because corporations, what's a corporation mean? Corpus is dead, Asian is to speak. It's a dead man speaking. Corporations can only deal with other corporations. So that's when they then created you, which was what AB ran through yesterday, your straw man, your person, your persona, your personality. That's where your name will appear in all capital letters, at least your surname. Check your birth certificate out. Check your bank statements. Check the fines that you receive. Your surname appears in all capital letters. Capitus diminutius maximus. No rights. You are a slave. So who's the master and who's the servant there? It was known as the crown of the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth. Commonwealth Games. The Commonwealth. Oh, we're all part of the Commonwealth. Who, what do you think the Illuminati think the word Commonwealth means? What was the commoner? The slave. The peasant. Wealth is your sweat equity. Commonwealth is the sweat equity of the slave. You own nothing. What you own is the right of... Now listen to this. The right of use of the title, and the title represents a dot on a map. That's why they can just kick you off your property whenever they like. What does it say? RP, lot. Lot on an RP mat. Lot stands for location of title. Who's getting this for the first time? Who's a bit pissed off? You own nothing. The Vatican owns it all. So the reality is that when you uh, consent, and you do it voluntarily, when you consent to be part of the system, you do it by uh, voluntary means. And it might not feel like it. Who thought they had to apply for a tax file number when they turned 17, 18, 19, where it was? Yeah. Did somebody hold a gun to your head? Why did you do it? Well, we'll talk about why you did it. You submit, sub meaning under, applications, applicate to beg, to be under their jurisdiction. Juris is the law, diction is to speak you voluntarily submit to be under their jurisdiction. That's what you do. How did they do that? So if you're going to start up a business, what's the first thing you do? You go to a, an accountant who says, hey, you need to set up a business or a trust or a sole trader or a partnership and apply for an ABN. That's how you have to do business in Australia. Why do they tell you that? Because they went to university, uni meaning one, versity meaning version, one version of information that is mind control to tell you what to do as good little sheeple. Make sense? Isn't it interesting when you actually learn what words mean because you think they mean one thing? So the average wage slave turns up to work at 9 o'clock if they're lucky. Most people have to get there earlier or they're fired. You get there at 9 o'clock and you work from 9 till 11 paying income tax. Income tax does not pay for infrastructure. It goes to the IMF to pay for the national debt. To who? Where'd the national debt come from? We'll talk about that later. From 11 till 1, you'll pay all the indirect taxes. And I'll talk about them in a second. So every time you fill your car up or you buy a loaf of bread and so on and so forth, you're paying indirect taxes. From uh, 1 till about 4, you're paying your mortgage, your debt till death, or rent, which is somebody else's mortgage. From 4 till 5, there's a little bit left for you. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just a far more insidious form of slavery. That's what your day looks like, well, doesn't four to, it? Four to five, you pay your credit card bills usually, electricity bills, how they're going up, all the rest of it. There's not so, many people left. So we're going to talk about some alternatives, but uh, the alternative is, is operating through a foundation, if, if, especially if you're in business for yourself. Um, but don't feel that you're shirking your responsibilities to society. This is not about tax evasion. Okay? You pay taxes every time you go and fill your car up, every time you buy a loaf of bread. And there are what we call compound taxes. So just look at a loaf of bread. It starts with a seed that's patented, that costs money for the patent. You then plant it. You then have the farmer who uses all his fuels, the patents on the tractor, on the motor, on the tyres. Okay? It then gets harvested. It then gets milled. It then gets uh, sent to the baker and baked. And then there's the, the freight in between. Then there's the wholesaler. Then there's the retail. How sales many taxes are in there? Sales tax, GST. So a $4 loaf of going. bread is about $3 worth of tax. When you fill your car up, how many? Do you know what? We've got a client. Um, I think it's BP that he has. He's got three BP stations in uh, 
in Sydney and he set up a foundation for us years ago and he said to us, me years ago, I had a lengthy Skype call with him. He said, you know what, Mark? Uh, I think fuel at the time was a dollar fifty nine a litre. What is it now? A dollar seventy something? I don't uh, know. I think it was dollar fifty nine at the time. He said, "You know what the raw cost of fuel is? Forty two cents a litre. There are seven taxes on fuel. Seven. He said, "I shouldn't have BP out the front. It should say ATO." AB's just going to run through here a, a great document. So if you are in the public and you have a tax file number and and uh, or, an, or an ABN, this is part of the goods and services tax. This will show you what their jurisdiction has over you. Yeah, it's um, one of the questions we get is, well, what can the tax office do to you if you're not in the tax system? Well, nothing in that, at that point if you are completely 100% private. What we would then do is say, well, listen, if you're in the taxation system and you're worried about the ATO, you should be. You really should be because you have to comply. Tax file numbers, straw men, you must, otherwise they will move you along and do whatever um, nasty things they say they're going to do to you because you are in the public system with your straw man. You joined yourself to it. As an example of that, I'm just going to walk down here because I like to use the pointer. This is the current GST legislation, and I've read this thing from cover to cover. Um, this is just one example of all of the taxation charters, okay? The commissioner, who is the ultimate top of the tree, pyramid for the ATO, the commissioner may disregard the scheme in making declarations. For the purposes of making a declaration under the subdivision, the commissioner may... A, treat a particular event that actually happened as not having happened. And treat a particular event that did not actually happen as having happened. And if appropriate, treat the event as one, having happened at a particular time and having involved a particular action by a particular entity. Look, it's highlighted. And treat a particular event that actually happened as one, having happened at a time different from the time it actually happened or having involved particular action by a particular entity, whether or not the event actually involved any action by the entity. <laughs> I, I, this is deadly serious. I didn't write that. That's, that's the truth right there. It's, uh, just Google that. It's section one, 165.55. That's just on GST. You find similar stuff for pay as you go. You find similar stuff for income tax. Okay? It, is a, it is designed by them. It's their system to enslave you, they have complete 100% control. So that one is, is quite amazing and we use it all the time and people are shocked. Is that part of a system you guys want to be part of? Once you understand how this works and if you read, um, so I'll take a step back, there's 888,000 not-for-profit foundations in Australia right now as of the date of the, um, I think the last Australian Bureau of Statistics put it out. Only 177,000 are registered, to give you an indication of why and how that works. So why is it that every sports star or rich family in this country, i.e. the Salteris, why do they have foundations? They don't pay tax. Tax is for us, the sheeple, to pay tax. When you have enough money, you don't have to pay tax. Like... Uh, uh, like Kerry, like Kerry Packer, I was going to say, he turned up to the commissioner and he said, well, why aren't you paying tax? And he said, well, why would I give it to you buggers? You don't know how to spend mm. it properly anyway. Do you yeah. remember that? That, that's, that is a brilliant quote, and I actually I should put that on there. But I was, going, I was referring to Jabba the Hutt, Gina Reinhart. So <laughs> I, was trying, I was trying to be polite, but she is Jabba the Hutt. There is no doubt about it. And you have that scumbag Tony Abbott leaning in, trying to uh, take his instructions from her, as Ian pointed out yesterday. He, here's the thing. This, this is the aha moment, okay? The paradigm that you have has to change to here because we are so 100% focused and, and told that we must ask for permission. You don't have to with a foundation. You are self-assessable. That's the tax office term, self-assessable entity. So when someone says, can I pay for that? I say, would you like to? Yes, we'll turn that around. I can. So I can pay for fuel, yeah. Can I um, pay for my, uh, you know, the groceries that I'm going to go and pick up? Well, the answer is, would you like to? Yes. Well, you can because the aim of the foundation is to achieve the goals and objectives of that foundation. And what happens is you have two people come together, have a meeting of the minds. Actually, that didn't, well, that wouldn't work. Um, Steph and I came together, <laughs> had, a, had a meeting of the minds, and we set up a foundation to achieve a goal. We wanted to achieve a goal to do something. And that could be free to shine or anything else that you're passionate about. So once you've done that, you then fall outside of, and you're outside of the, the jurisdiction. 
you are actually then able to do anything you like to achieve those goals. So if buying the milk and the bread and all the rest of it at Woolworths feeds you and sustains you and your family so they can go to school, so you can now go out and achieve the goal of the foundation, then it's sustenance. And sustenance isn't taxable. It's now, if you happen, right. to, if you happen right. to get some income, and income is taxable, if you happen to get digits, we call them digits because they're electronic digits. They're not, there's not money. You don't have dollars in your account. You have electronic digits. So if the digits come in and it's more than sustenance, than you need as sustenance, that's then surplus. There's no limit for surplus. You can have as much surplus as you like. You don't have to have a percentage that you give away. We give up to 50%. So that's our decision. But on average, most people do 10%, something like that. If you're paying 33% tax now and you give 10% away, everyone in the room, I would assume, would like a 22% increase on their current wage pay. Yeah? It's not hard. It's not brain surgery, is it? So I don't pay my 33% or my 46%. I can do what I like and save and help people and I've got this extra surplus here. You can have as much as you like and there is no percentage number that you, you have to give away because it's up to you. The paradigm shift is don't ask for permission because you don't need to in the private. You do in the public, you don't in the private. You can ring the tax office and say, hey, I'd like to open up a not-for-profit foundation. Can I operate that way? They'll go, yeah, sure you can. We suggest you register it though. They do. And they go, oh, okay, fantastic. So anything else? Nope, off you go. Done. It really is as simple as that. Yeah. So the essence of the foundation is to sustain the participants, anybody else that works within the foundation and the foundation itself, and to give back. Is that a tax dodge? It's not. You're contributing back to something that you feel passionate about. So I guess what we're going to ask here is, is what legacy you're going to leave. You know, the essence of the foundation, as I said, is to sustain you, and whether that's food, your fuel, gym membership, holidays, whatever. Whatever it takes to sustain you and keep you happy, but it's to give back. And, uh, and for us, we're very passionate. Is Steph still here? I mean, Steph's uh, an animal rights um, activist, big time. And so we give to uh, Free the Bears, Sea Shepherds, a big one. And, and there's a couple of others, Charity Water. But our main one is Free to Shine. And we're going to talk to, to Nikki very soon. And I can't tell you what an amazing feeling it is mm. every time we send money off to Nikki. Mm. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we sent her another couple of thousand dollars. She's like, she's like she, you know, so grateful because it, I sent it on the Tuesday. She said, that means Thursday, Mark, we can go and save another, I think it was six girls. Mm. So, you know, on those tough days, and we've got tough days, don't we, where it's hard to get out of, out of bed and, and trudge off to work, when you know there's a deeper purpose to what you do, it makes it a lot more fulfilling. As far as um, challenging authority, can it be done? The short answer is yes, it can. I've certainly done it successfully. Your straw man essentially is your agent in commerce, and we might talk about that in or the straw man in those terms over the next couple of days. But uh, it's your public entity, and there is also the private entity. So, on your birth certificate and those of everyone's birth certificate, there's actually two dates: the date that you were born and came into the world, and you became you essentially. And go home and check this: there is a date that you were registered. They're both on your birth certificate. Your birth certificate is your warehouse receipt, okay? It's, it's your agent in commerce, it's your corporation, doesn't matter which way you want to look at it, it's the public entity that interacts with everything else. So we'll, we'll go into that in more detail tomorrow, but that's the concept. And moving forward, um, it'll become more and more apparent to you that what a scam that is. And I was really pissed off when I found out about this. Uh, this authority is essentially is just a concept, it's a social concept, it actually doesn't exist. It only exists because we all think it does, which then puts it into reality. Uh, raise your hand if you do not know that the local government is not a legitimate organisation in Australia. It has no powers, none. Okay, so there's a few. Okay, we councils are not recognised under the Constitution. Same principle applies. So how do they operate? They operate via statutes. And a statute is a rule. It's, this is not verbatim as far as Black's law, but it's... Uh, it's, a, it's the way I've remembered it, so this is how you're going to remember it too. It's a rule created by a representative governing body and it's usually for the good of the general public that carries the full weight and extent of the law when given consent by the governed. Okay, consent by the governed, that's you. Are they legitimate? The answer is yes and no. No if you don't want them to be and yes if you do. Um, is, any, is that uh, shocking to anyone? Has anyone you know, realised that councils, they've got bylaws, 
all the other little laws they make, all the things that there's no such thing as a bylaw. They can't make legislative laws. They can't do it. <clears throat> what you have to do is research and study and get your head around how the scam actually takes place. Because when you know how something works, you can then start to, to break it down from the inside if that's if it's all possible. This first bit in yellow is maximising the amount of fines and other money penalties paid before enforcement action is taken. They tell you in their charter, in the first page, what the organisation is about. Maximising the money penalties paid before enforcement action is taken. That's because if they can get you fearful and intimidate you enough and threaten you before they have to prove it in court, then their job is done. Okay? They don't like to have to go to court to prove it. Number one, if you raise an argument about jurisdiction, they're fucked. They are. Okay? It's as simple as that. It's these guys. It's a privately owned company. This is the Salteri family. And the Salteri family, if you, according to the BRW Rich 200, is the, uh, the seventh, yes, it's the um, seventh wealthiest family in the country at one point something billion dollars. And that, again, that was a bit dated, so they have a lot more money than that at this point in time. But these guys get your money. So if you thought that you were paying your parking fine and it was going to, oh, look, it's going to go to the council and they're going to do stuff and fix the potholes and you know, do all that sort of stuff, you're wrong. It doesn't go to them. It goes to a privately owned corporation. Does that piss anyone else off? So, what do you think happened on my first response? Well, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, so we're writing to you about your contact with us regarding the penalty notice, yada, yada. Uh, we examined the details of the penalty notice and using our review guidelines, considered the issues you raised due to the circumstances. We've decided to cancel the penalty notice. You do not need to pay the penalty, and this is the bit I enjoyed. We apologise for any inconvenience this has caused. <laughs> they go ahead. They go ahead with full knowledge of that. And that's when you can send them a fine. Remember, remember this, is another, this is another key point. The law was designed as a double-edged sword. The difference is, is you don't realise that you have one of those edges. Okay, you have the exact same right to charge people, to charge, uh, for example, a politician. You can actually go to a justice of the peace or a notary and have a warrant for their arrest issued if you have a barrister and or a lawyer who would actually prepare the documentation the way they're supposed to be. We have both, by the way. It's, it's a system designed by them for them. There are, they do allow us to use it against them, but they don't tell us we can, and then, of course, the ignorance and the apathy and all the rest of it, the fluoride in the water and yada, yada, the riddling for our kids, and ultimately you think it's just all too hard. I'll just pay the 55 bucks. Okay. So toll roads, Queensland motorways. I thought Queensland motorways were... Queensland motorways, I thought they were the government. Queensland toll roads, all those sorts of things. I thought they were all the same. They're not. So that was my question. How can, how can what is essentially a private corporation for profit be getting my revenue that should be going to the governments for paying, for example, for the roads and all those types of things? So, not unlike all of the other things we've discovered, we tend to get um, pressure or advice from the other organisations that if you don't tell anyone about it, we'll let you off. And in particular, the banks and the stuff that I did with my credit cards, I had them write to me and say, listen, if you don't tell anyone about it and sign this stat deck, and the confidentiality agreement will let you off your loan. So I did. And then I set up the website and told everyone about it. <laughs> so that is what happens with toll roads. You can get out of tolls if you question the jurisdiction of the toll road operator. Now, these are just the, the fun things that we just laugh at because they're just so ludicrous. But coming back to what Paul said and what Ian said, the, the psychosis, we have this psychosis... It's an all-pervasive psychosis, and if you want an example of it, there's an example of it right there. Why is it 100 cops can control 100,000 people? We had this discussion with Steve the other day as well, and he was saying you know, the, the crowd could tear them apart. They could, but they wouldn't. Why would you? Because it's not, it's not a socially acceptable thing to do, and it's not the right thing to do, and if you live by the rules of do no harm, then you can go to a football match and not have to bash the cops or go and you know, attack them. If they're police officers or peace officers, 
then they're, they're doing their role. But we are like the horse tied to the chair. We don't challenge authority. We're taught not to challenge authority. Okay, it's just ingrained with us. That's a great example. But most people are good. You know, most people are not going, there's no cops here. We're not, we're not bashing each other and stabbing each other and ripping off, you know, all everyone's purses and wallets and taking money. Because most people have common sense and logic. Psychological fascism, if you ask me, is what they're doing to us, and they've been doing it for a long time. And what happens is they're escalating it. Ian talks about, and particularly tomorrow, he's going to talk about how they ramp up, what they're doing with their agenda. They, they, they hide everything in plain sight. It's like those contracts going to 10x, hidden in plain sight. They tell you, we're giving these family over here $332.1 million a year. Sorry, $323 million per annum. So what they do by the introduction of things like Vlad laws, and, and you know, how do they do it? They install someone like this, Nobed. Okay, and they are puppets. They are completely controlled puppets. There is no doubt that they are running an agenda. If you, if you don't think the political parties have a hidden agenda, then you're in the wrong room. Because these guys have now, in Queensland, become dictators. They are dictators. Okay, they're not elected representatives. They're not someone who is accountable to the people. They are 100% totally in control because of the bikey laws. So if we think, if we know, if you listen to Sam, that water is life and we're all made up of essentially 98% water and our cells, our blood, everything to do with it, you wonder why they would put a fluorotoxic poison into the water system, unless they had a specific design or an agenda to achieve a result, and that result is to, to dumb us down. I mean, I, I think that one of the most important factors that you need to take into consideration, if water is life, why can't you put tap water into a fish bowl and the fish lives? Like, if it can't support life in any way, shape or form, nothing lives in tap water. It dies. So, conversely, when you put it inside you, what do you think it's designed to do? And why is it designed to do that? You can go on to the conspiracy theories as long as you want, Agenda 21, all of the, the stuff that goes with it. But the fact is, is it's quite simple. Fluoride is poison. So, that it's a neurotoxic poison and it's in your water and it's in you. It's in every one of us here. <clears throat> they banned it in 98% of Europe. That's got to tell you something. So hydrofluorosilic acid. Um, I can't walk out and point, but um, if you take the, uh, the danger poison sign and the skull and crossbones and the warning and the do not take it internally, literally, then it's a problem. Now, don't forget, Roman talked about how he uses rainwater and his garden thrives. But when he uses town water, it just survives. Again, it's clearly evident in that, in that example alone that town water has, is not meant to sustain life. This is what it was designed for. This was originally what fluoride is designed for. And then, and then it, it is amazing to me that they can put that into our water and then tell us it's good for us. If the government was so keen to, about, worried about your health and keen to do something for you, why don't they alkalize the water and put vitamins and minerals in it? Because your teeth would be fine, of course. It doesn't make sense. They stick poison in it. And we are all told that poison is good for us. Well, actually, not in large doses, but little doses, it's OK, because it won't kill you too quickly for them to go and have anyone to, to be held accountable for your death. OK? But it's killing us all slowly. We're not going to argue with them whether it's dangerous. We know it's dangerous. Everyone's clearly evident on the bag. Just look at the bag. That should be evidence, exhibit number A. What we're talking about is the forced medication of the population. So if you, if you wanted to be medicated and you're enjoying the fluoride, great. You don't have to do anything. If you want it out of the system, we have to band together. If we don't band together, an individual is not going to do this. You, first of all, you couldn't afford the legal case in their courts. You forced it onto us. We didn't want it. We now have to remove it. You forced us to remove it. So we are going to ask for compensation to remove it. So that's fifteen to $20,000 per household. OK, for those that can't read it, I, Anna Bly, is the instigator of forced fluoridation in Queensland, give my personal guarantee that water fluoridation causes no adverse health effects. And in the event that it does, I will accept full liability and will provide financial compensation. So 
the signatures, that's, that's the state seal. That is Anna Bly's signature. There are six witnesses on there. You might even see there's a no the phone number on there if you're smart enough to take a picture. He's 34 years at the National Cancer Institute. In point of fact, fluoride causes more human cancer death and it causes it faster than any other chemical.